Good afternoon. At least it's good afternoon while I'm taping this now. Um, we are beginning our lectures for the second test, and this will be over the Baroque period. The Baroque period dates are from 1600 until 1750. It's a 150 year period where a lot of change happens for music. For the Renaissance, I defined it as an intellectual awakening. Well, this is where our musical intellectual awakening appears, is at the beginning of the 17th century. To this first lecture is going to be just about styles and some terminology that's associated with the Baroque period. So I want to backtrack just a little bit to the Renaissance. In the Renaissance, of course, there was not just sacred music that was being produced. We focused on sacred uh, compositions for the Renaissance, but in addition to those, there were uh, still chanson, French love songs, and there were madrigals that were being composed. Madrigals were composed in both the English tradition and the Italian tradition. In the English tradition, the madrigals were very lighthearted, drinking songs, tavern songs, finish this lyric for me, deck the halls with boughs of holly. Fa la 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 la, right? Well, that is a re English Renaissance madrigal. And uh, if you were three sheets to the wind at your local tavern with your uh, buddies, you could still at least chime in on the fa la 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 la's. So the English songs, again, were very jovial, very lighthearted. But the Italian madrigal was much more mature. A lot of poetry was invented around this time, and the musicians were very inspired by it. A lot of times the poetry was poking fun at religious or political leaders of the time. So composers would take a look at the poetry, select their favorites, and set them to music for contemporary purposes. But what they did was they, they tried to allow the music to sound like the meaning of the text. So for instance, if the text talked about heaven versus hell, then the music might sharply ascend when it was discussing heaven, and it might sharply descend when it was discussing hell. Well, this is a very elementary idea that's referred to as word painting. You can see on your PowerPoint that I have word painting in bold, underlined, and in all caps because this is a very, very important concept that began in the Renaissance, but now is going to continue in the production during the Baroque period. And I'm going to be showing you over the next few lectures how word painting is utilized in the opera and the oratorio and the cantata and even in instrumental compositions. The three word definition for word painting is music, enhancing text, where the meaning of the text is echoed in the shape of the musical line. So music enhancing text. We're going to be talking about word painting a great deal. The word Baroque, the English word Baroque, is derived from the Portuguese word Barroco. In the Portuguese, Barroco was the term that was used to describe a worthless pearl a pearl that was misshapen. And so it was not something that you wanted to hear as a critical term for your new art. You didn't want to have anyone think of your art as being akin to a worthless pearl. But over time, this thought changed. We see changes in art first within architecture. We might refer to it as a Gothic structure today. Things that had uh, levels to it and the columns and the moldings and the uh, gargoyles up at the top, the other sculptures. This was very different from the very plain lines of the structures that preceded this. And so at the beginning, people typically don't embrace change and they did not, did not like it. And so they refer to it as being Baroque or, or Baroque. Eventually, fine art, literature, all these other areas started to become more ornate, more elaborate, 
and eventually by the time music takes its stand to change here at the beginning of the Baroque period, it's more of an accepted practice. So for us today, Baroque art simply means that it's very dramatic. It's very over the top. It's very flamboyant. It's very energetic. It's very emotional. And so um, as we move through several of these different forms that originate in the Baroque, listen out for um, dramatic uh, music, music that has a, a definite edge to it. We also can pinpoint the exact beginnings of the Baroque period. There was a group that called themselves the Camerata, and today we call them the Florentine Camerata so that we can remember that they lived and worked in the city of Florence, Italy. And this was not just a group of musicians. I'm going to talk more about the Camerata uh, when we start discussing opera, but the Camerata consisted of, of all kinds of different artisans, and they all had their own um, project that they were working on. They had their own individual employer or patron, but when they were able to um, meet and hang out together, they discuss what they were working on, but they also started to discuss how it would be wonderful if they could pool all their talents together. Now here comes the ancient Greek culture and the discoveries made in the Renaissance about it. They knew that the ancient Greeks had produced these pageants in the Colosseum. They knew that it involved music and theatrics, but they just didn't have anything concrete to look at to go by. So they just started to discuss what all might that involve. And so the Florentine Camerata is responsible for the invention of opera. Opera is by far the most important discovery made in the Baroque period. It's also one of the two platforms that I like to take uh, as a music, a music appreciation instructor. I like to leave my classes with this overarching idea of how opera progresses and then the other main form of music, the symphony progresses, of course. There's a lot of other forms out there, but this is the beginning of the opera. Now, just some terms that uh, are important for the Baroque period. The first term is monody. Now, you might look at that term, you might look at that word and think monophony, one of the textures that you just uh, learned about for the first test. Don't do it. <laughs> what we have done is we had monophonic music with the chant for the first 800 years of the medieval period. Then we went into polyphony. So we've had a 300 year heyday for polyphony. Now moving into the Baroque period, we're moving into our other texture, homophony. One line of melody with harmony. Monody means one song. So what you have is you have one singer, and that one singer is going to take care of the melody, and then you're going to have instrumental accompaniment, and the instrumental accompaniment will provide the harmony for it. So it's textbook homophony. Monody means one song, one singer with accompaniment. So let me describe for you a, a situation where a piece of monody might be created in the Baroque. Let's say I um, attended a, a Lutheran church in the 1600s, and a young lady at that church, after a service, came to me and said, I would like for you to sing for me at my upcoming nuptials, at my upcoming wedding. The Italians really loved hearing music fresh. They always wanted new music. And if you were going to sing something again for a second time, then they wanted it to be changed up somehow, some way. So I would ask her, have you heard a song that you feel captures the love affair between you and your future husband? And she might say, no, I really haven't heard anything that I really think is uh, appropriate for us. So I would continue asking her some questions and I would say, well, um, did your betrothed ever send you a love letter that might have a love poem in it? Oh, why, yes, he, he did, she says, and she produces it right there on the spot. So I say, I need that text. I need to take that text to our music director of the church, the official musician, the composer, 
and we'll put together a piece of monody for your wedding. So she says, oh, that's perfect, and it will be something special for our special day. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then I leave that conversation, and then I make a long walk to the music director's office. The music director is probably also the organist of the church. And so I knock on his door, and I enter, and he would not be happy to see me, especially with a piece of paper in my hand. The music director um, probably was wearing many hats. If it was a larger city, then he was probably creating music anew, fresh for the church service, but he might also have other responsibilities for the town. So he might be creating music for the Lord God above and then also the Lord on earth for entertainment pursuits for that particular city or town. And so music was always needed. And again, they wanted it to be new and fresh. So this would be bothersome for him to have to create this new little work of monody for this new wedding. But he would agree and he would say, well, in the meantime, come back in a couple of weeks and see what I have for you. But find a cellist in the meantime. Why would he ask me to go find a cellist? Today, if I was asked to sing at a wedding, then I might just use an accompaniment track or I would use maybe just the pianist in uh, my particular home church because that's the instrument that we use there. But back in the Baroque, you had to be accompanied by a certain combo, a certain group, and that group was called the Basso Continuo. The Basso Continuo usually probably had three, four, or five members at its heart but you had to have two specific people. A keyboard instrument, and for the Baroque period, we don't have the piano yet, so this is harpsichord or organ, and then you had to have a low bass instrument. That's why he asked me to find a cellist. So you might need a cello player or a bassoon player, for instance. So I would put together the basso continuo by finding a cellist. In a couple of weeks' time, we go back to the organist, uh, studio and he says yes I have something let's work on it. What the composer the organist has put together is a line of music for the cellist. The cellist would have a bass line harmony that they would be able to look at and play. What the organist would go by would be that same bass line melody but underneath it there were all these numbers now, I want you to refer to your PowerPoint here. On a slide, I have a couple of different uh, examples of this, where you have a note and a bass clef, and then there's numbers underneath it. Those numbers underneath it are telling you what notes to add above the written note. So, for example, the first one is a C. That note is a C in the bass clef, and underneath it you see the numbers 6 and 4. So you would add a six above the C, which is an A, and you would add a fourth above the C, which is an F. And so that builds an F major chord in second inversion. So again, that's a lot of information, but that's what's going on. In the second example, again, you have a C, but this time it doesn't have a number underneath it, so that would tell the organist, the composer, the keyboard player to play a chord with that as root position. The next note has a 6 under it, so you're adding the interval of 6 above that B. And then the next note, which is a G, it has a 7 underneath it, so you're adding the full chord and adding a 7th. So all those numbers were an indication. This is called figured bass notation. <clears throat> you might remember hearing about a secretary from the past taking shorthand dictation when she might be asked to come in and uh, write down a letter that her boss needs to send out. This is kind of the same thing. This is a shorthand notation for com uh, compositions. It's called figured bass notation, where you would have a bass line harmony, bass line melody that's created, and underneath the given notes you would have the numbers, the figures underneath it. So that cellist, back to my story, the cellist would have a system of music to look at, the organist, the keyboard, would play those notes and then 
pay a lot of attention to the figures underneath it. What would be written for me, the singer, the person who was going to have the melody, the supposed most important line in the composition? Nothing would be written for me. He would have some sort of melody in his head and the organist would hum it to me until I kind of got the gist of what was going on. We would rehearse it a few times and then I would fix the melody to fit to, fit to my range and fit to my own individual abilities. Because again, I would want to be as great as I possibly could on this day so that others would later hire me for other occasions. So the melody would change and I would adapt it to suit my needs. On the day of the wedding, we would perform it. Now here comes the problem. Another lady is at that um, particular wedding, loves the song. She's about to get married herself. So she wants to use that song in her upcoming ceremony, but she doesn't belong to that church. So she's not gonna use me, she's not gonna use the organist, she's gonna use her own musicians. So she goes to the organist, purchases that composition. So he's now overjoyed, a little less upset about the fact that he had to compose it because he's made money off of it twice. But what is she given? She's given that figured bass notation and another piece of paper, that text. And so when her musicians get a hold of it, well, it's not gonna sound anything like our performance because they weren't there. They didn't hear what we produced. They're gonna take that music, they're gonna take that text and they're gonna reinvent it themselves. When I was in graduate school, one of the worst classes that I had was a theory class where we were taught about figured bass notation for a couple of weeks and then we were unleashed in the music library. And we had to go through these stacks and find Baroque compositions. And there were these folders that were huge, huge folders. One page there was a text, the other page was a figured bass notation. So we would have to take that notation and fill in all the gaps, fill in all the harmonies, and add the text and build a, uh, build a melody to correspond with it and finish out the whole composition. It was crazy, but uh, it was a very good insight into what was going on during the Baroque period. When I come back for our next section, I will finish out uh, talking about the other terms from this, the Baroque period. Thank you.